That is where we are going today, the Catskills. So it's currently November in upstate New York, which is where I live and where I'm from. And this is personally my absolute favorite time of the year. If you live somewhere like this where you have autumn and you see the trees change every year, you can probably relate. I thought it'd be a really great time to talk about today's video topic because during this time of the year, we're all a little bit more aware of and maybe more appreciative of trees. Maybe a little bit more than other parts of the year because we are very aware that their leaves are quickly dropping and they're getting ready for winter and we have to say goodbye to them temporarily until spring. So what better time to learn about and talk to you about some of the oldest tree fossils on our planet from the Devonian period. And it turns out that I'm not very far away from where the oldest tree fossils were discovered and where some of them are on display today. So I drove across the Hudson River west to the Catskills and wanted to show them to you. Um, they're in a little town called Gilboa and there's a small exhibit of these fossils outside of a really tiny museum which just so happened to be closed when I visited. But that's okay because I still got to see the fossils myself for the first time and show them to you. So if you're from the northeast or New York you may have heard about the Catskill Mountains. They technically aren't real mountains in a geologic sense. A lot of the times when you think of a mountain you think uh, or a mountain range, you think of something like the Himalayas or the Tetons where there's these huge peaks pushing upwards. But these mountains usually form when there's some sort of compression or convergence of plates, tectonic plates, or some sort of subduction where volcanoes form. These mountains, uh, the Catskill Mountains, actually formed as sediment that came from ancient mountains to the east 370 million years ago during the Devonian. So at this time, the continents were at very different locations and there were mountains to the east and an, epicon an epicontinental sea to the west, which is pretty much just a shallow sea that's laying on top of continental crust and it's not necessarily an ocean. So there is a sea and there were these huge mountains. These mountains were shedding a lot of sediment off of braided streams, which were pretty much just these streams that had water and sediment moving so fast down these steep grades off the mountain that they formed many channels that braided into each other. You'll see these a lot in places like the Himalayas or really high elevation areas where there's lots of water and sediment coming off of peaks. So these were coming off these peaks, carrying all this sediment for millions of years. And this sediment eventually deposited to the west in this shallow sea. There was a lot of marine life. So there were a lot of brachiopods and crinoids and a lot of uh, like trilobites. There weren't dinosaurs yet for millions of years. There weren't anything close to mammals. There weren't humans, obviously. So over time, all that sediment I was talking about deposited into all these little river deltas, which we now refer to as one big delta, the Catskill Delta. This compacted into rock, so there's shale, siltstone, sandstone, conglomerate, limestone, lots of different types of sedimentary rocks. Over time, these rocks were eroded by glaciers and rivers and other geologic forces to now look like a typical mountain range, like what you think of when you think of mountains. We made it! Please excuse the beeping noises in the background. There's the highway department right over there, right next to the museum. <laughs> okay, so here I am at the museum, but it is closed today. That's okay though, because it's a beautiful day and I was able to see the fossils that are um, displayed outside of the museum and I'm also going to go to a roadside exhibit the camera is falling I'm also going to go to the roadside exhibit that's set up like two minutes down the road that I pass on the way here I'm just going to let that do its thing <laughs> please just stay up what the heck? anyway the fossils here are the first tree fossils that were found back in 1920 they were actually first found in 1869, 1870, when there was a big flood here in Gilboa and they were trying to clean up and they found them while, you know, digging up the roads and trying to repair everything. Scientists didn't really 
study them very much until 1920 when the Gilboa Dam was being built. Um, a little quick history about Gilboa Dam. It first started being constructed in 1919 and finished in 1927 and then repairs started on it again in like 2007 and I think there has been kind of continuous repairs on the dam the past several years. Um, that might continue for a while. The location of this museum and the roadside fossil exhibits are really great because it kept a lot of the fossils at the spot where they were discovered and likely where they were deposited millions of years ago. Um, a lot of the fossils were taken away to other museums, you know, like the State Museum, maybe some in the, um, the Natural History Museum in the city, in New York City and also other museums around the country and maybe the world. So it's actually really cool that several of them were actually kept in their home. So it's nice to be at the, at the actual museum of the home of these oldest tree fossils. So here we are. Here are the famous fossils. These are the 382 million year old Eospermatopterus fossils. And these are essentially the stumps or the bases of the trees that used to be here right in Gilboa where they were discovered and essentially these are sandstone casts of the tree stumps so the way that they were formed was essentially as the tree rotted away the sand greens filled in and filled in the shape of where the tree used to be and eventually the sandstone formed when all of those sands were compacted into rock. When they were first discovered, unfortunately, these were the only parts that were discovered. The other parts of the trees had not been yet found, so scientists didn't really know what the rest of the trunk looked like or the crown or if it had leaves or anything. A lot of these fossils were actually found in a place called Riverside Quarry, which was a little quarry that they used to mine a lot of the stone during the construction of the dam. In 2007, there were actually some repairs that had to be done, done on the Gilboa Dam, and this actually led to even more discoveries of more of the fossils. So at this time, more parts of the trees were finally discovered, which definitely helped increase the knowledge that we have about these trees. Eventually, full fossils of the same types of trees were found in different parts of the world, like Venezuela and Belgium, and they were actually from the same time period. So this really helped scientists piece together, you know, how the tree existed, how it worked, and lots of other stuff about it that otherwise would have been pretty much impossible to figure out from just the stumps in Gilboa. So the Eospermatopterus trees grew to be about eight meters tall, which is about 25 feet. And they were not really like what we think of as modern day trees. They had a structure that was really similar to bamboo or celery. They had really sponge-like trunks and they actually had no leaves at all. <laughs> Instead, they had these little branchlets at the end of the branches that looked kind of like, that had like a fan shape to them. So this big chunk where the um, base is at the end of it, you can also see a lot of the other, I think these are stems of the same tree. And these are what I was talking about as the branchlets. See, they're not exactly leaves, but they almost look like palms with the long um, shape of them. If I get a little closer, you can see the texture of it a little better. So back when the Eospermatopterus tree lived, um, it created a lot of litter at the forest floors. In modern day trees, we see leaves, especially now as fall is starting, leaves and sticks like this one. <laughs> this stuff nowadays gets broken down because the bacteria and the fungi have the ability to break that stuff down. But back then, millions of years ago, they have not they hadn't evolved to do this yet and all of this litter wasn't properly broken down so all of that carbon all of that carbon material created layers and those layers compacted into coal and i just love sitting in here next to these fossils it's just so crazy to me that i only drove like an hour to get here and this has been here my whole life 
and I just had never visited. I didn't really know about it until sort of recently. But it's just really cool sitting here amongst these fossils, knowing that without them, we probably wouldn't be here. There's some pieces of rock here that have other fossils in them, like all these shell fossils. So these are bivalve fossils that were marine fossils during the Devonian. And you can see, you know, the other side of them in here. Oh my gosh, look at this tiny little frog. He's so cute. Oh. <laughs> He's just hanging out with the tree stumps. It's his favorite spot to be. Maybe he thinks he's still in the Devonian. Let's get another angle of him. He's so shiny. Goodbye, friend. I'm leaving. I hope you have a good day. So there's actually another spot you can go see more of these tree trunk fossils only about two minutes away from the Gilboa Fossils Museum. So some of the ones I uh, showed clips of in the video are right outside the museum. And then there's another little roadside exhibit and this was put together along with a diorama that isn't there anymore from New York State's first woman state paleontologist. And she worked for the New York State Museum for pretty much her whole career. Her name was Winifred Goldring. And she had a big part in the discovery and the first early studies of these fossils. This is only one of the many contributions that Winifred Goldring made to New York State and to geology as a whole. Winifred worked at the New York State Museum for about 40 years where she focused mainly on Devonian life. Oh, okay. Whoever made this exhibit is very clever because there are some ferns here. Look, they're distant relatives right next to each other. Okay, so little quick side lesson. These guys were not seed bearing plants yet. For example, this willow tree and all the other trees around here, they reproduce through seeds. They're either a gymnosperm or an angiosperm. And ferns reproduce through spores. So in a fern, if you turn it over, you can see these little dots. And that's where the spores come out so that they can reproduce. And these guys reproduce in the same way by using spores. Oh, this root system of the Gilboa fern tree was found by Kristen Wickoff. After the flood of 1996, it was dragged out of the banks of the Schoharie Creek by Lester Parker and donated to the town of Gilboa. Okay, so this is more of like the underground part of where, of like the actual roots of the trees. They called it the fern tree because it's like a fern. Um, so this is like what was underground of most of these guys. So these were like the base. And that over there is more of root system underground. You have them to thank. <laughs> I'm just gonna start saying that to all these trees around. In 2009, there was actually yet another discovery of a fossilized forest found in Cairo, New York, which is about 30 miles east of Gilboa. This discovery is unique to the Gilboa tree stump fossils because it actually wasn't really the trees and the stumps themselves, but the root systems at this site, which is actually a bit more exciting because scientists can actually get a bit more information from the root systems instead of just the trees and the stumps themselves. At this site, it was mainly the root systems of a tree called the Archaeopteris, but there also were Eospermatopterus trees here as well, just it wasn't the main fossil, it wasn't the main focus of this site. And it's actually really exciting that the types of trees found here were the Archaeopteris trees because of two reasons. One of them being that the oldest known Archaeopteris trees at the time in 2009 were 365 million years old, but these newly discovered fossils were actually 385 million years old, which is a 20 million year difference. The second reason is because the Archaeopteris tree is actually a lot more complex than the Eospermatopteris. The root systems, they were a bit more complex and they also showed that the trees had woody tissue that the Eospermatopteris did not. So the Eospermatopteris trees were more like a primitive, um, kind of short-lived tree and they hadn't really developed things like woody tissue yet 
Um, like I said, it was mainly like a cell, um, like a celery type structure or like a bamboo. It was more hollow. They didn't even have leaves. This also has a lot to do with the setting that these trees existed in. So at the Karo site, we see the Archaeopteris trees, we see the Eospermatopteris, as well as one more type of tree that was found there. And at the Gilboa site, it was mainly just the one type of tree stump, the Eospermatopteris. Scientists think that at the Gilboa site, it used to be a more swampy type of area, so it was a little more waterlogged, there wasn't really well-draining soil, and because of this, the trees that evolved there didn't really have a very permanent structure and they didn't really have the ability to have woody tissue because they would have been pretty much just drowned if they tried to do that. So at the other site, the Karo site, this shows that since the Eospermatopterus trees were also there, it shows that those trees could exist in these wetland swampy type areas, but also in a more well-draining soil kind of area that the Archaeopteris trees also existed in. Scientists think that the forest floor that was found in Cairo actually was part of a forest that stretched all the way down to Pennsylvania, which it would have been a very huge forest in its day. And they also think that it was wiped out by a flood, which I find kind of ironic because the first discoveries of these tree fossils started out from a flood in Gilboa and also from humans purposefully flooding an area to make a reservoir. I did mention a third root system, a third type of tree, and it's yet to be officially identified of what exactly this root system is, but scientists think that it is a uh, lycopsid, which is not really similar to any modern day trees we know of, but more similar to a club moss. So why should we care about the world's first forests? Why is this important or relevant at all to our understanding of of earth, of life. Well, the carbon dioxide levels are actually a major part of this. The carbon dioxide actually dropped drastically when the first forest popped up on our planet. They actually dropped 10 to 15 times actually what they were before the trees evolved. After this, the earth became a lot more populated by woody plants and more land animals evolved as well after this. There was also a rapid incline of oxygen levels about 300 million years ago on earth and this is believed to be the cause of huge insects like wingspans of about 70 where is it? 28 inch wide wingspans on some insects. Can you imagine going outside and seeing a cockroach the size of an eagle? So a little comparison of these ancient trees to modern day trees. How, how do the trees outside compare to what we're talking about now? Well, actually most trees that you see today are angiosperms or gymnosperms. Gymnosperms pretty much just means naked seed. This is like a pine cone from a pine tree. The seeds on there are not enclosed in an ovary like angiosperms are. Angiosperms have an ovary surrounding the seed, like a flower or a fruit. Think of like an apple tree versus a pine cone. One of those is enclosed, one of those isn't. So one modern day tree that exists currently that you probably have in your city or your town somewhere on the street is a ginkgo tree. These trees are most closely related to ancient trees than any other living trees on the planet. And they're part of a group of trees that have now since died out with no other living relatives. The oldest specimens of ginkgo fossils in the rock record are from about 270 million years ago in the Permian and have seemed to not change much since then, which is why it's referred to as a living fossil. A ginkgo tree can live up to a thousand years and are commonly found as street trees. And you'll mostly only see male trees because the females produce seeds that smell not so great. <laughs> if you go up to a ginkgo tree today, the seeds on those leaves are likely to be dispersed the same way that they were about 65 million years ago, right before the dinosaurs went extinct. Ginkgo trees are the only type of tree whose ancestors would have been eaten by dinosaurs. So technically you could go eat leaves off of a ginkgo tree and you would be having the same meal as a dinosaur may have had 65 million years ago. So there you go. Now you know a little bit more about Earth's first trees. And if you live in New York state and you live nearby this place where you can go see the fossils, I highly recommend going and checking them out. 
and maybe actually go on a day when the when the museum is open not like i did when it was closed so i hope you learned something and thank you for watching